Appreciate your patience. And a lot of it, honestly, a lot of it's like interface stuff. You know what I mean? You're jumping over to the YouTube stuff, whatever, and you're, and you're monkeying with the stupid, you know, just kind of, okay, there's a thing. It should be really, really straightforward, you know. And for whatever reason, it's not. But we're getting it. Okay, so uh, we ought to be live. Can somebody just give a con uh, confirmation over on uh, on the YouTube channel um, about us being live? I mean, it's not, and it's not super critical because most of the live we're doing on Discord, right? But um, Yeah, that it's streaming. It should be streaming out on YouTube with like a 15 second delay or something or 10 or something. Uh, really just kind of for those that are watching there but don't really care about the interactive element, right? And then it just for ar archival purposes. Uh, in fact, let me just... Should just be able to check it. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, there's three people watching it right now. And then um, I'm just going to drop a link in the general chat, okay? Where are we at here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Okay, so I got the link over there. Um, let's see. I think we're real. <laughs> we're no longer fake. So that's great. Um, Let's see. Um, all right. So, hey, welcome. So, this is um, we. Do we have any of the uh, of the uh, folks that came from the section four and five evening stuff? We got some more of you guys, right? We should have everybody moved over by now. So, if you so if anybody's you know here right now and is still kind of like confused about what to do. You go to my you go to my uh, YouTube channel. All this, by the way, is in Canvas. Okay, if you just go to Canvas, um, and you know, look at the syllabus. It'll walk through links to my YouTube channel. Um, okay, so are there are there any questions about any of that stuff uh, from anybody? Just you know, unmute and uh, oh, and and by the way, just another reminder: um, any audio here is going to stream to YouTube. So if you have any concerns at a personal level about the privacy of that, whatever, you don't want a voice print out there or you just would rather, you know, not be sort of audible on a, on a YouTube uh, broadcast, um, then just, you know, be aware and, you, you know, if you have a question, so you can chat it in the, in the chat stuff on Discord. Um, No, YouTube won't care about it, but some people do. Just personal privacy. Oh, how dumb you are. Oh, they're not going to care about you. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Same here, right? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, they're individuals, and so I, I give it as a warning so that you just know that anything you say here in the live audio chat uh, can and will be broadcast on YouTube. Um, and if you have any other privacy concerns, like you'd rather I not mention your name or anything like that, just let me know. And then I'll just, you know, be, be sensitive to that because there's just different, you know, different reasons why, why people have different, um, needs. That's why the arbiter of any of that kind of privacy stuff has to be you, you know? Um, okay. So in terms of like, if you're still like kind of new to the thing and, you know, this first week is kind of like get get things sort of set up and, and working and make sure everybody knows what's going on. So really, really important right now is, is to get on Canvas and read the syllabus. Okay, read the syllabus to understand how the class works and then go back and watch the, the video from Tuesday, which is on YouTube, 
um, uh, there's a little bit of delay because you guys were like the first broadcast of the semester. So it was, it was even worse on the technical difficulties front. But, um, you know, just go watch that. And, uh, and if you, but does anybody have any, oh, I'm not streaming on Discord. Thank you. Thank you, David. M totally my bad. Yeah, man. Uh, told you there's no rhythm. There's no rhythm here. Hold tight. Yeah. Okay. Hang on a second. I'll be, I'll be live here on video on YouTube in just a second. Um, Voila, c'est moi. Je suis ici, Dr. K in the house, video and everything. Okay. Thank, man, I was like, I'm like, we're rolling. Hey, everything's great. But I, yeah, thank you, David, for that heads up, man. Um, yeah, okay. So that should be good. And by the way, um, some, it seems like once per class, I don't know why this is, uh, like a Discord bug or something on my on my macbook or so, i don't know what it is but um it it'll like just get to a point where i suddenly can't hear you but you can hear me if that happens where you're like making comments but i'm not responding um just chat me and just be like yo dr k uh you can't hear us and then all i actually literally have to just like restart discord um but audio is good right you can you can hear me on audio Everything's happy that way. Um, and I just want to do one other quick thing. Let me see. I put device. Let me see. Input device. Ooh, ooh, ooh. hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, all right. That should be better audio on the input. Does that suddenly sound a little bit better audio wise? Yeah, okay, sorry about that. This is all settings stuff. And then this one is the other one that's a little more dicey. Um, okay, you, everyone can still hear me, right? Crystal clear, yeah. Crystallis, okay. Then I think at this point, we should be in a position where I'm going to just do a thing real quick where I'm going to turn on. You're going to hear an echo here. Um, Let me see. Is anybody watching on YouTube right now or has the YouTube thing rolling? Because I just want to make sure that the audio from, from, uh, from you guys, from the students, um, is coming through the YouTube stream. So can I get a random student to say a random thing? Well, it doesn't matter what it is. Hello? All right. Then can I, uh, yeah, keep more random things. We need more data more, for the, for the live talking. test. More talking. Yes. Excellent I'm work. Talking. Random words from students. Uh, and then uh, if somebody's watching on YouTube, if you could do a confirm that the audio from the students is popping through. This is what happens. I don't have my own, I don't have my own like, you know, uh, producer, you know what I mean, in the booth to just make sure all this stuff works. Uh, so I wind up tuning it every time. Uh, anybody, anybody? I'm going to try something. Hello, people of YouTube. It is I, Christopher Walters. Welcome to CS2810. We're here to learn about computer organizational and architectural structure. I'd like to talk to you today about the concept of abstraction, which is to uh, theoretically zoom out on certain concepts. Uh, this allow, for example, when you're driving in a, or when you pick up a cab and you say, take me to the airport, there's a lot of <clears throat> underlying things that go into that. For example, you need to understand that uh, your cab driver knows where the airport is, that your cab driver knows how to drive a car, that the compression waves that signify on the most basic quantum level movement are working as intended. In the real world, this is not something that you ever really need to concern yourself with, but in computer programming, things break down all the time, seemingly for no reason. And so abstraction is the ideal state of programming, but you always need to be able to understand how to unabstract or deconstruct, as it is sometimes referred to. 
All right. Excellent work, Chris. Wow. Yeah, yeah, good voiceover, right? Nice. Uh, I'm always uh, on the hunt for that nice kind of radio voice, right? So um, uh, what we need to do, Chris, is uh, throw together a... Um, it doesn't really matter what you say, but it has to start with, in a world, right? You have to do in that. A world. In a world. Yeah, that's where we're going to go. All right. Okay, that's great. I think we're rolling, technical, whatever. Crap, man, only 18 minutes to lost. It's all right. We're going to be okay. Um, okay, so seriously, Chris, thank you for that. Uh, are there any, any confusions, questions, anything lingering? This is your chance. Uh, there are other chances, right? And also how we're doing this thing where we're live video during this first block, which goes from like 1 to 2.15-ish. Um, and then there's, a, you know, those of you in section 4, uh, it's a 2.30 to 3.45, and during that, during that block, you watch the video from right now, and then you can pause and ask me questions, and I'll just be, uh, I'll continue on the voice channel after that, and here in the, in the general chat on the uh, testing lobby server, okay? Anything? Is it okay if we're from that block, but we watch it? live right now oh yeah instead of later oh absolutely yeah you can and vice versa right if you're from this block and you're like yeah really i need nap time and i'd rather just watch it the only thing i the only thing i'm concerned about is any and this is kind of personal choice so i'm not going to control it but anything that turns into a sort of an endless procrastination like well i can always watch it code for i'll think about it in you know October and you're desperately screwed by October, you know, if you haven't, so you got to be personally self-managing this thing. Uh, you know what I mean? That's my only kind of concern, but how you do it totally up to you because we're live. The, the live part has a certain, you know what I mean? For a lot of people, that's kind of a nice touch just cause you know, you're there and we're there. And, but that's also why I stay live on the server, even while the second group is watching. You know what I mean? So you can pause and ask questions or whatever. But yeah, do it however you want, however it works for you. Don't treat this class like a Netflix binge. Do, no, you can't do it, right? It's a little bit like this. I sometimes will say, and I'll say this over and over again, uh, for those of you that speak a language, right? I speak a couple. Um, and y you can like read a book, an entire grammar book, from a language you don't speak, and you can read the whole thing, you know, like in a day, and you will speak zero language, right, from that language. You have to give it the cook time. It's got to have some slow cook time. And so you've got to pace it, get in, get it started. Um, this is a class where there's a notorious tail off, uh, in part because it's so just up to you to manage it. But college is also about managing that that time and that schedule when you've got the flexibility and the freedom right so it's not like i have a son who uh graduated from army signal school and uh when you're in army signal school you're either in class or you're wall. <laughs> you know what i mean you're like in class and then your job is to like stay till your homework's done you know what i mean you're going to get through that this you can waltz off and then just sort of let it linger and float. And I know this because I did this myself when I was a 17-year-old freshman and oh so very, very dumb about school and college and that sort of thing, right? So, which I'm going to maybe just tell you just a little bit about. Um, so, are you ready? I'm going to go some slides. You ready for some slides? Feels suddenly oh, real. Man. Crazy. Let's do it. Okay. So, yeah, what I'm going to do, quick introduction, okay? Um, this one here, this is, and by the way, these slides are up on Canvas. I, got a, I, I made a couple little tweaks, and I'll refresh, and I'll put uh, the new slides up there, like right after class. But I wanted you to just have, uh, that's my email that you should use, okay, right there. Um, uh, I know that, I, here's the hard part for you, I know that, professors vary in terms of like whether they would like you to use canvas only you know what i mean i know the rules are different and so i apologize and nothing i can do about 
the fact that there are differences. But I would really strongly prefer you, first of all, that you ping, that you hit me up on Discord. Just DM me on Discord, okay? That is the quickest path. And if you're like, I did that, and then you didn't respond for like five hours, I assure you it was a quicker path than had you uh, sent me an email or, or... So number one is Discord, okay? Number two is this email address. Um, I do have like 14,000 emails in my inbox. That's true. So that's a problem. Um, but the Canvas email thing is got some serious clunk. And the whole interface, the threading, the ability to just like work in that space. And it's really got some issues that, that make me crazy. So I really... So for some of you um, that, that sent me a, 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 a note on Canvas, the first thing I said was, please hit me up on Discord. I'm not trying to be like snarky, like... I don't want to talk to you, you know, if you don't hit me up just right. But I am saying it'll get you more responsiveness if you get me on, on Discord. And DMing me is, is probably the, the best way. You can also, you know, go to the channel, go to the, um, to the server for CS2810, the testing lobby. Um, all right. That's my LinkedIn. I will uh, happily accept any of you uh, as LinkedIn uh, connections, right? Uh, there's no, there's no grade, you know what I mean? There's no like uh, suck up to the teacher points for that. So, uh, but I do strongly recommend you start early with a LinkedIn profile. That's your professional view and you, and you can have resumes and everything else. You go looking for jobs, they're going to look you up on LinkedIn. I guarantee it. It might not be 100%, but it's going to approach that. Okay. Let me see. That's my Twitter um, I have like a public facing Facebook where I sometimes do Facebook live things uh, about various topics. Um, but those are just some other, you know, just some other links, um, some of which are fresher than others. Um, hang on a second. Also, by the way, when I look to the left, I've got the thing you see on this screen here that looks like an external monitor is in fact an external monitor. Strange, right? And um, so whenever I'm looking that way, I'm looking at the actual monitor that's here in my, uh, on my desk. All right. Um, so, oh, and I wanted to say one other thing, though. Um, I would prefer it if you guys would call me. There's a thing at UVU, and I don't know how, why, or what. I've never seen it anywhere else, but where people will just refer to me as professor. Uh, professor? Okay, to me, that's just like, you might as well just call me old white-haired man, you know, it's just sort of like vague reference to some descriptor that has no personal anything attached to it, like whatsoever. Old man, right? Then suddenly you're in Monty Python of the Holy Grail, right? You there, boomer, answer my question. <laughs> That's right. Okay, boomer. So, right. Um, yeah, right. I don't, I don't like it. And so my rule is just understand that this is my happy rule. If you call me professor, I will call you student. I just think that's perfectly fair and it is symmetrical, right? Um, professor, yes, student. Okay. Uh, so I prefer you call me Dr. K. That works. Dr. Knudsen, too many. I have the polysyllabic last name. So, you know, Dr. Knutz or Professor Knutz, too many syllables, I'm good with it. Call me Dr. K, call me Chuck, because that's also my name. Um, really, all of, anything that's like just directed at actually, and then I'm trying to learn your names and, and address you by name. That seems like a reasonable trait, okay? But just so you know, uh, okay, I wanted to let you know just a little bit more about me. Um, I was at uh, the University of Iowa, I grew up in Iowa, did a double ma I was doing a double major in computer science and Italian with a minor in French. Um, and wound up transferring to BYU. And then at that point, you're just like, I got to get out of here. I'm getting old. Some of you know what that feels like. Uh, so I was, um, this is really important. I was 28 when I finished my undergrad. And the reason I say that is some of you are like, crap, I'm already 27. <laughs> you're like, you know, yeah, fine. Or some of you are like older than that. And some of you are like, whatever, you're 18 and doing it like the spec is supposed to show. I'm just not a big fan of the spec. It works for a lot of people. It doesn't work for a lot of people. So I'm just trying to say, 
Uh, UVU, for me, one of the things I love about UVU is it's kind of the school of second chances. And I was that second chances kid, you know, 20, I was the 23 year old freshman, you know. And I remember, I remember telling, uh, when I just talking to one of my buddies at the time and just being like, starting college, I'm 23. And I'm like, dude, I'm going to be like, you know, 27 when I graduate, you know, and it felt weird. And I didn't know if I should do it because it just felt so, it felt so old at the time. And I remember him just going, yeah, man, you're going to be 27 in four years. How old will you be in four years if you don't get a college degree? I'm like. 27 and it turns out I wasn't 27 I was 28 <laughs> and then I was 34 when I finished my master's degree and I was 38 when I finished my PhD you know and I was 40 before I was in a tenure track university position I'd done a lot of cool stuff so you know what I'm trying to say it is not too late my friends and so if you're I just want to throw that out to say if you're in that kind of like late breaking club you know of folks rolling back around, you know, usually there's a good percentage of folks in here that are in their 30s or in their 50s and you know, 40s, and they've even had 50s. Um, man, it is seriously not too late, ever, 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 okay? I'm a big, big fan of never stop, okay? Don't stop learning. Don't stop believing, as Journey once said, okay? So I just wanted you to know kind of where I came rolling in from. And uh, this was that story, right? It was 1977 and I was 17 years old and so unprepared. So that's kind of, uh, you know, as Rocky Balboa said, it ain't over till it's over. You remember that movie? What was that from the, what did he say? What is that from the 80s? No, yeah, I think he goes, where's that from the 80s? And he goes, probably the 70s. I think that's how the quote goes. Sylvester Sloan. Anyway, all right. Um, a couple other just kind of cool things. So you know a few, uh, like why I care about the subject matter, the assembly language and architecture stuff. Uh, I went off, uh, when I was an undergrad, I kind of really dug the operating system stuff, the low-level hardware. I don't know why. Not, not so much the hardware per se. You know, I wasn't interested in being an electrical engineer and creating batteries, you know what I mean, for example. You know, I really wasn't. Uh, but for some reason, when you got down to the hardware, um, it's like it got interesting to me. And so my first job was actually at Hewlett Packard in 1988. My first, like, not my first job job, but my first full-time real company brand name, right? I was doing stuff for a couple of years before that. Uh, and I was working on the original HP personal computer, which was called the Vectra. We called it the Vectra Classic. And uh, that was back in the early days of the PC industry. And I wrote device drivers for OS2, which was a great operating system, by the way. It was a great operating system. So much that was so great about that. I left HP. I didn't really like it. I didn't really like the Bay Area. It was just too crowded, you know? Traffic, any of you from the Bay Area? Traffic, you know, traffic jam, dead stopped on the freeway at midnight on a weekday. What the crap is that? So I really didn't uh, appreciate all of that. Um, but then I went to Novell, uh, came back to Utah, and that was my first exposure to, um, to networks and data communications and, and communication protocols and which it actually turns out to be crazy, crazy cool. Also pretty low level. So when I went off to Oregon to do my um, PhD, um, bumped into these guys that became you know, great friends and hired me. Uh, they were doing infrared data communications. That was before Bluetooth. It was before Wi-Fi. This is where, this is where we, earn, we earn the white hair right here, okay? I was doing wireless data communications when it was infrared, like in the Palm Pilot, right? Uh, my company put that software in the Palm Pilot. So all that infrared beaming, if you've ever heard about that or seen anything about that back in the day, that you could do where you could move things between Palm Pilots by pointing them at each other. That was my company that did that software for Palm. And uh, we had, it was, in the end, it was at least a billion units. It had to be. But, um, but it was before Bluetooth and it was before Wi-Fi and 
There were just other solutions, you know? Oh, seriously, David used to trade Pokemon with, on a Palm OS device? David, that's awesome. Um, and waiting for the response on that one. That is, that's fantastic. Oh, they had it on the Game Boy or something. Okay, yeah, yeah, but that's the idea. That was Erda. The, the spec was called Erda. Like a TV remote, but it's not actually remote. Uh, it's a transceiver and there's some stuff. Anyway, it was really, really cool. And then I, uh, you know, uh, I was also, I founded a company called Kinpoint where we did genealogy software and specifically this app that some of you may have seen or used uh, if you are of a particular religious persuasion, shall we say, that is somewhat popular in the state of Utah, uh, you may have seen a thing called Take a Name. I don't know if anyone is familiar with this smartphone app. There's about a half a million users. Anyway, but I designed it. Um, there you go, Cody. Yeah, so that's my, that's my app. That's my product. Um, half a million users. Uh, n very much a niche market. You know what I mean? Super niche market, but, but pretty cool. That was what Kim points. So that's kind of the professional side. And then academically, I was on faculty at Oregon State for one year, BYU for about 15, 14 and a half, where I was uh, the founder of the mobile computing lab as well as the Sequoia lab, which is kind of software engineering stuff. Mobile computing lab, we were doing just wireless stuff, mostly Bluetooth and IRTA, but also, you know, Wi-Fi and... Satellite, GPS, RFID, you know, wound up actually uh, came out of all of that with like one patent with, with two students uh, in the, from the mobile computing lab and one patent actually in the uh, genealogical interface space, which is kind of cool. Anyway, but I've taught in a bunch of settings. I once taught, I've taught high school, like not full-time, but, but part-time high school, adjunct everywhere, community ed, I've taught internet safety to preschoolers, like literally in a, in a drop in and do things. But I once taught in the 80s, um, about 87, I taught um, word processing on Apple IIs to Laotian refugees as part of a community education program. <laughs> now, I don't know who gets to put that on their resume, but I do. And that was just crazy and it was it was word perfect was the uh was the word processor back and it was on apple twos so anyway but again just a little bit about me so i've taught a ton in a lot of different things and by the way when i did this software engineering stuff at oregon state it was actually in the oregon master of software engineering program and everything was distance ed this was pre really pre the internet existed, but it was not even remotely possessing the bandwidth to do what we needed this thing to do, right? And um, uh, and so everything we did was basically via satellite. And we had our own satellite connections through this Oregon state program for software engineering. So I had like, you know, 25 students in live in class in... Um, like Beaverton, Oregon, but another 15 or so that were in Corvallis and another five or 10 that were in Eugene. And then I would move around. I did at least one originated broadcast from each of the other remote locations. So I was doing distance education, you know, talking into a camera in 1999, you know, so 21 years ago. So this isn't, so when we went, when we went remote after spring break last this year, I mean, I've, and I've been doing various things so I could, for example, teach if I had to be on the road or, so I've been doing that for the whole 15 years I was at BYU. Um, I had the means to do remote stuff and I've experimented with a bunch of different things. So when we pivoted, uh, it wasn't a, any kind of a freak out, you know. Also, I just realized this is, uh, this picture over here, <laughs> that picture, it's the closest thing I could find to like a mug shot because I've never been arrested, but uh, it, it, it's actually a passport photo, but we need to maybe have a sort of like a beard, no beard. You know what I mean? And if I just rock this thing and don't trim it, I'm full Santa mode by Christmas. Solid, solid Santa. And you, not everybody can rock that. You know what I mean? Not everybody can rock the white beard. So, um, I don't know. I, any, any, if anybody's got any opinions about, about, uh, uh, beard, no beard for Dr. K, you know, I'd love to, 
I, I live my life basically by, by you guys. So you're going to make all the major decisions in my life this semester. So I, I hope you're up to that. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. What comes next? Oh yeah. Me. Um, yeah. So I got a bunch of kids. I'll show you a picture. Um, but I kind of mentioned languages. I'm really a language guy. I love Duolingo. I really recommend, really recommend Duo as a way to learn languages. Some of you have served like missions, right, for, for the LDS Church. Or some of you, um, maybe English is a second language. Uh, or you just dabbled, you know what I mean, and had some other exposure. I think Duo is fantastic as a refresh. It's, it's fantastic. It, free as well. So I love Duo. Um, I love music stuff. I play, I'm just kind of, uh, I don't know, I got issues. But if anybody's interested, we have a, um, a server called School of Rock. I'll post an invite, okay, to School of Rock for you. In fact, I'm going to post it like just right now. Um, essentially, it's just something I pulled together at the end of last semester. And the reason was because we were all just going stir crazy you know, with the dumb quarantine, um, there's an invite, there's an invite to School of Rock, okay? And while we were trying to do on School of Rock was just create an opportunity to just do something remote, you know what I mean? Uh, let me see. Uh, so on the loose connection, okay, let me see. Are you, are you guys still able to talk? That's not my side, is it? on Discord. Somebody say something. Just, just want to yeah, make sure. Yeah. Okay, we're good. We can talk. Yeah. All right, we're solid. Yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, so no, I, um, so School of Rock is a place where we were just going to try to, like, anybody interested, maybe try to put something together remote, you know what I mean? Do some remote music thing or get together, do the jam session thing, whatever. I play, I play drums, I play bass, I play guitar. Um, I used to be a really good vocalist and something's been happening to my machinery for the last five years. It's probably, I don't know if it's aging or if it's something else, but I can't sing so consistently anymore, but I used to be really good. But yeah, the music stuff, if you and again, if anybody's interested, just jump on, join the school of rock. You're more than, I dropped the invite. Um, I am a book guy, love literature and all kinds of book factor. I, I read compulsively. I usually read 10 to 15 books at a time, which is a little psychotic. I'm going to grant that. I'm going to grant it. Um, but I'll just give you an example. I'm going to pivot. Do you see that desk? That's just, you know. Oh, and also, if it comes down to it, just talk to the hand, okay? Um, but anyway, uh, no, I, I usually, it's just a read. So if anybody, at any point, if anybody wants to just like talk anything, like Dr. K, what do you think of, you know, whatever, it's all good. And I'm happy to just, I want to hear about your music, what's cool. Current obsession, Foo Fighters. I am in an intense Foo Fighters phase of my life right now. That's not a bad phase to be in, frankly. Um, but anyway, you know, compulsive reader, compulsive writer. I've written a number of books. Uh, yeah, so how many books have I read? This year, I'm a little bit under normal because um, there's been a lot of weird stresses. So it's probably like 10. Um, but in a normal year, um, I'll peak at about 50. That's a peak. And I'll probably average about 25 so, you know what I mean? Two books a month on average. But again, I can kind of look at, and I track all the books that I read. So I know, I, I know every book I've read for the last 22 years. Weird. It's a little OCD, right? I'm gonna, I, I admit this. So anyway, but I love writing. Uh, now, speed reading, yes and no. I speed read by nature, but it's a little different. Um, no, anyway, uh, any, so the bottom line is if you ever want to just like talk about anything, you know, grab the DM or in the channel or whatever, and you want to just talk about a music thing, a book thing, it's just, to me, that's, 
we're we're all lacking a lot of human contact these days with the with the quarantine environment. You know what I mean? So a little human touch is, goes a long way. Okay, there's uh, there's my kids. There's my nine surviving kids. This is a this is a bittersweet photo. So um, a little less than half of these kids in that picture are adopted, and so six of these kids are adopted. Uh, th sorry, three of these kids are adopted. Six of them are not. I'm not going to tell you which ones are which. It's usually fun to try to guess. You're going to always be wrong uh, as far as which ones are birth kids and which ones are adopted kids. And for me, it, it don't make no never mind to me, which or whatever. I don't, you know, it doesn't matter to me. But this was actually a, uh, a gathering as my youngest son was uh, struggling in the hospital. And he's not in that picture and he's not with us. Uh, so the picture holds a lot of love and emotion. And my family is a family that, you know, this is a waiting room of a hospital where, you know, the littlest one is, is 18 at that point and not going to make it. And uh, just love. That's my gang. These are the people I love the very most in the world. So, and, and laughing. And laughing, you know, that's 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 the ethic. Uh, you know, it's just it's all about the love and the laughter. And I think there's something about that. But I wanted you to see who my people are, uh, you know, just so you got some some sense of that. Uh, and I and I will also answer any questions at all about these people. You know, if anybody, uh, this guy here right there, uh, Brad is one of the best chess teachers in the state of Utah. If anybody is like Jones and on some chess lessons. Brad was the Utah State Amateur Chess Champion when he was 18 um, and is an incredible teacher. I've had chess lessons from him and he's amazing. And uh, anyway, great group. Happy to, happy to answer any questions. Um, now, what I'm going to do, and by the way, interrupt, you know, yeah, no, he was no Bobby Fischer. <laughs> no Bobby Fischer, but he was, I don't know what his rating is. <laughs> It's pushing 2,000. I mean, he's really, really good. But um, what I want to do right now, um, we're good on time. I'm, I'm actually going to defer just a little bit on this philosophy of learning, but I do want to hit a couple of things with respect to this, okay? Um, there's, a there's a story. Uh, it's only two pages in a PDF that's on the on the canvas site okay and there's a link to it from the schedule it's not it's not required in the sense of um in the sense of you're gonna have to, you know you're gonna get points for reading it but i want you to read it okay i really do and what i might do in the next week or so is is pull it out and share a little bit about it like why i think it's important and i don't know if i have a question on the first on the first module exam that, but there's a question that I think shows up on the module exam that basically is, what does the fish story have to do with CS 2810, okay? The fish story is about learning. It's about education, all right? So I'd like you to read it and, and it's not really long, but just give it a little time, digest it. You know what I mean? Think about it and, and try to see what it does for you. And I'll come back and talk a little bit more about it. But it really is about, it's really about taking personal responsibility for your own learning. Because we get in this mode in college where, um, where some, not just college, but high school especially and before that, where we kind of like hang out waiting to be spoon fed. You know what I mean? Be like, you know, fed and burped and diaper changed, you know? And, I, I guess I understand at some level where that comes from. But, and then some of you have had parents that were very much, you know, helicopter parents and, um, you know, kind of... Uh, no, the story, uh, the story is on Canvas. Go to Canvas. And if you just look on either the schedule, the stories are listed there. And you can just click right there to it. Or go into the files. Okay? Um... <laughs> hey, I did not say, I did not say, are you blind? Uh, 
because you got to find the schedule for starters and you know uh, but it is uh i'm just being clear i'm just being clear that i didn't i didn't accuse anyone of being blind but uh in the files there's like additional readings and it's there and there's another one called the orders of ignorance by philip armor which is an excerpt from a book um that one's a little heavier but it's really really valuable as well but i really want you to read take this fish and look at it and you know what's fascinating i was um I was at, well, I was actually at Nico's Pizzeria. Um, can I get an amen for Nico's? Is there any amen for, for Nico's? It's down the parkway. It's toward BYU. It's closer to BYU, so maybe that's more BYU stomping around. But I think they've got some Wolverine gear. I think there's some Wolverine swag hanging in there. But it is my favorite, my favorite pizza place in Utah County. It's kind of Boston Thin Crust. See, now I've got to try this. Oh, it's so good. Did No, come on, man. We're not... Are you seriously going to throw down a puke face on that? Is that... Is that... Okay, and I don't know what your name is there, Tea Timer, but um, is that about Nico's specifically? In which case, we're just going to have to part ways. You know what I mean? I can no longer be your friend. You're banned from the class. <laughs> That's right. You're banned. You're banned from the, from the class. No, I... Uh, for me personally, so right, I was I was a missionary in Italy, right? Many, many, 40 years ago, I was in Italy. I kind of fell in love with Italian, oh, I kind of fell in love with Italian pizza, you know, Italian food, my gosh. What are you going to say about that? But this Boston Thin Crust has this thing, this kind of Italian thing. And it's just not like that crappy whatever you guys buy for two bucks you can't tell the pizza. It's like cardboard with cheese on it. You know, whatever that stuff is you guys eat. Keeps you alive while you study. I don't, I can't do that stuff. So um, I just want to say Nico's. Shout out for Nico's, okay? So that's, I'm, uh, that's Nico's. Also, I'm putting this in the comments. Yeah, yeah, I'm hating on Little Caesar. Yes, yes, I am. Oh, Totino's Party Pizzas. Mmm, mmm, mmm. No. Anyway, there you go. Nico's or Nikolai Tai. It's on uh, Cougar Boulevard down, uh, again, just a few blocks from BYU. But it's just on the other end of the parkway. Um, anyway, I know what I'm doing for strongly recommended. I was there last night and uh, I have a lunch meeting there tomorrow at noon. Anyway, and if you're into the truly, truly authentic Napolitano margarita pizza, you go to Sette Bello in downtown Salt Lake. That is... La Bomba, that is the bomb, okay? Sette Bello. Downtown Salt Lake. That is authentic, authentic, cooked in a Napolitano wood-fired oven imported from Naples. Okay, that is the real freaking deal. Uh, Morgan didn't know I have not had Lucy's in Orem. Is it better than Little Caesar's? That's my question. That's apparently not a high benchmark. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Oh, no, no Olive Garden. No. Okay, I can see that we have to do some attitude adjustment here uh, among some of you and raise your sights. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, so. Ah. Uh, whew. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would, if I had, if I had the cash bones, I would definitely go field trip for pizza. I would. And I have had meetings, many, many meetings at Nico's. Okay, anyway, what I'm trying to say is Nico's great Chuck's cheeses, yes. Um, Chuck K cheese, different. Um, but I've had, uh, anyway, I was at Nico's with, uh, actually with a couple of students. And uh, from my research lab, there is pizza sometimes when you join my research lab, uh, which is another topic we'll get to. But anyway, I'm there. And a former student from 15 years ago, I'm bringing this back. I'm bringing this back to take this fish and look at it. Um, former student just happens to be there at Nico's, okay? And um, he just comes over and I've got like a couple of my kids were there. One of my kids and I do this pizza and python every Friday because he's learning python and we just eat pizza at Nick's and we learn python and it's fantastic. Both are fantastic. Anyway, so this guy... Um, 
Oh, Zach, I was not responsible for bringing that little, and it should be called little Caesars, like you spelled it. Um, anyway, I didn't bring that pizza. That was brought. We'll talk later. But anyway, this student, his name is Carl, comes popping over. He's like, hey, can I join? You know, like, yo, Chuck, can I join you? Yeah, come on over. But former student from 15 years ago, he has either a master's or a doctorate. I think he's got at least a master's. He comes over and he's just kind of talking and getting to know my students and stuff, you know. And then he goes, you know what Dr. K did that changed my life? And they're like, what? And he's like, he made us read this story called Take This Fish and Look at It. It was 15 years ago. And this was only like six months ago or nine months ago or something that this happened. And he's like, that story kind of changed my life. You know, just, I'm just saying, I'm not just throwing this crap at you, you know. It actually, and I read that as an undergrad. I probably read that when I was 17, when I was flunking out, ironically. Uh, but it, it, it did something to me and, and hopefully it'll help, right? But there's no grade associated with it. It's just actual learning. Okay. I want to tell you real quickly, uh, by the way, and I really do love the, I love the comments kind of rolling through it. it to me, I've talked to some of the professors, some of my, my colleagues, and they're like, yeah, the comments start going and I'm just like, I can't, you know, it's like distracting. I, it's that multitasking thing, like reading 15 books at a time and, you know, playing a bunch of instruments, not at the same time. But, uh... This thing starts to roll with the comments, and I, I really, really, I enjoy it. I like the richness of it. And you can drop, you know, comments and whatever, collaborate, stop, collaborate, and listen. You know what I'm trying to say. Um, but here's the book. Now, this is version two, edition, second edition. Uh, third edition is, I think, out, I think, and it's fine. You can grab that if you want. Um, and then one of the other questions that, that comes up is, can I get by without the book? The answer is yes. I try, to, I try to provide everything in the slides that you would need. You know, Now, renting this book is not crazy expensive. I know you can rent it for somewhere in the 20s. You can rent the digital edition for like Kindle for around 20 bucks. 20 yeah, maybe. Ex right. There's a couple and of digital versions. That's the third. Yeah, so, and I don't, I have somewhere here, I have the third edition. Looking, looking. Uh, and I need to double check it. Um, but basically, if you're reading along with that, you're going to be fine. But I'll, I'll, I'm making a note to myself to just, I have not done a deep dive to really compare it to give you any, like, um, you know, road bumps or things to be, you know, worried about. Okay, but I will do that this weekend. This weekend, from now through Tuesday, is when I'm gonna catch up with everything crashing in on the first um, part of the semester. Okay, I have it somewhere, and I don't know where. Somehow, somewhere. Is that Chris again? Unfortunately, I'm gonna shut you down, man. No, actually, no, <laughs> no. Uh, I can see Chris is going to probably need to come to the School of Rock. Um, everybody's welcome at the School of Rock, even if you're just a spectator. Um, okay, so I'm just saying the book is old. The new edition's out. That's great. But even the old book that's 15 years old, look, assembly language doesn't change that much, right? The von Neumann architecture that we're going to talk about was the 40s, and it's still like the model of how we do what we do. Fundamentals of assembly language, the 50s, 60s, you know? I programmed an assembly language, you know, in the, in the 80s in my first job out of, out of college. So I'm just saying, don't be freaked out by the fact that the book's older than you, okay? Uh, the material hasn't changed a whole lot. One other thing I just wanna say that, uh, that relates to the book and to what we're gonna do, we use this system called, uh, it, the book uh, has this thing called LC3. Uh, LC3, the LC stood for little computer. They first did this thing that they called like LC1 or something like that. Then, it was, then there was an LC2. And we use the LC3. It's just LC for little computer. Um, and we're going to talk more about this, especially as we get closer to actually talking about assembly language. 
Because, you know, one of the questions is, well, would you rather be like programming on a Raspberry Pi, like is in this bag, you know, would you rather be doing something real and live on a, um, this is the magic box up here, by the way, where you just don't know what's going to happen when Dr. K reaches up into the magic box. Oh, geez. Um, but what I'm trying to say is you can go Raspberry Pi. I did happen to have a Raspberry Pi at just about head level here in my little cabinet. But there's pros and cons from a teaching perspective, okay? All right. By the way, this was um, created by a, one of my business partners because when I, when I stopped shaving, their first reaction was that I looked like this guy. And I'm just like, I don't think so. I would never groom like that. You know what I mean? Not going to happen. But um, anyway, with the Raspberry Pi, the only problem is, I mean, I'm intrigued. And if anybody wants to like, who really digs the stuff and is kind of maybe ahead of the curve or whatever, or maybe you just had a little bit more kind of design stuff, circuit design, or spent more time in low level land, you know what I mean? Where you've got a little more, a few more cycles. It doesn't make you better. Maybe just makes you a little further ahead and your interests lie there. Okay. For others, they're just going to be like white knuckle just to do this thing. But if anybody wants to do explorations about the Raspberry Pi, how we can weave that into the class, the, here's the problem. The LC3 has 16 instructions, basically. I'm, I'm rounding and there's detail around that. It's like 16 instructions. There's no subtraction instruction in the LC3 because there's only 16 instructions. That's sign language for 16. Um, whereas the, uh, the um, do I have that right here? No. The um, Raspberry Pi runs on an ARM64 processor which is a 64-bit processor, crap ton of instructions. So the problem is, do you take the stripped-down set, you know? Do I, do, I, do, you, do, you teach, do I teach you with Legos that the concepts can groove in and you're not trying to learn all this other real stuff, but you also lose a little bit in terms of like a real environment, whereas the Raspberry Pi is a real environment, but the, the actual PDF for the Raspberry Pi, the spec, for the for the hardware itself, I th it's, I think it's over a thousand pages, just the documentation for the processor, you know, is like a couple times bigger than our entire textbook for the course here, and that's just documentation. It's dense, so that's that's my dilemma. Okay, and I have considered trying to do like maybe when we get into that part, maybe splitting and doing alternate lectures where if you want to do Raspberry Pi either on real hardware or on an emulator that you can find online that you could do it. You know what I mean? You could do it that way, but that's a bunch of work that I've got to do still that I haven't done yet. Cause I'm a lazy butt, you know? Also it was June, like three days ago. You know what I mean? And I'm still a little pissy about this. Um, okay. How are we doing? So if you are the kind that's really content, um, if you're content to be like, I'll go with your slides and trust you, it's totally fine. Save the 20 bucks. Uh, it, I, I, if you're the kind like I always was as a student, which is I really preferred to give it a read. You know what I mean? I wanted to read the whole thing to try to just get a full, make sure I had the maximally full picture, then absolutely get the book. It's really not bad. There are only a few spots that I would steer you away from, you know, where I think the explanation actually makes it slightly harder to understand, then I think it can be made, okay? The other thing about Raspberry Pi is it is something you can kind of put on a resume. You know what I mean? I wrote low-level software for the Raspberry Pi. You know what I mean? It's, it, and the truth is that's not really any significantly different than doing it for the LC3, but it's got some brand recognition. Does that make sense? So, uh, and nice, nice uh, Manfred Mann. Well, it's actually a uh, whoever. I don't know. By the way, if you want me to be able to know who you are, you can change your uh, your nickname on your uh, on the chat stream, and then I can actually call you by name. If you prefer to remain anonymous, it's all good. No, Blinded by the Light was a um, Bruce Springsteen. 
uh, uh, tune, but it was popularized in the 70s by a, a group called Manfred, Manfred Mann's Earth Band. I think it was the name of it. Anyway, a lot of radio time in my childhood. Thank you for listening. Okay, that's the book. Okay, now here's the deal. Let's stop. Let's pause for a moment. We've got 15 minutes. We can go a little bit over. I'm not sure who's got to like get to class at 2.30. I don't want to go too far over and I'll just try to be more on my game next time and start more on time. But any questions to this point about anything we've hit? Again, this is, this is a good opportunity to, um, to ask. Everybody know the song Blinded by the Light? Blinded by the light. That's right. And the oh-so-misunderstood lyric, revved up like a deuce. That was very misunderstood in my childhood. Um, anyway, so here's to Bruce Springsteen. Um, okay. What, what I want to do is just start in. I'm going to start diving here. How we get there, unmasking the magic. Okay, everybody ready? You're like, yeah, Dr. K. Let's, let's, let's actually do some real stuff. How about? I'm going to say, yeah. Let's start, but let's not get in too heavy. Let's start with a quote from a science fiction author. Okay. Now, Arthur C. Clarke, he wrote uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, right? Which was a really psychotic movie by Stanley Kubrick um, that is just hard to rock, man. Uh, no, but Arthur C. Clarke is one of the legendary sci-fi authors. He also uh, invented um, geosynchronous satellite uh, principles. True. But he said, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Everybody with me? You buying? You know, you ever do the thing where it's like, I mean, there was an old, uh, I think it was a, I can't remember if it was a Far Side cartoon or if it was something else. Maybe somebody can find this and post it. That would be good. Uh, but it was basically a bunch of equations over here. And then in the middle was just this, the words, and then a miracle occurs. And then on the right side was like, like, you know, the answer or the next thing, whatever. And then um, the, the professor is just like pointing to the middle. He's here. I think you need to clarify a little bit more what's going on right here, right? And uh, that, which reminds me of like every physics class I ever had, you know. It then naturally follows, um, sir, what if it doesn't naturally follow for me? You know, that was always, uh, you know, it then follows that. You know, it's a little bit like you're playing chess and then somebody goes, it then follows that checkmate, you lose. Like, hmm. You skipped a bunch of steps. So, yeah, so um, th what is it you consider magic? And I think the bottom line for that is uh, magic is anything you don't understand, really, you know? I mean, there's always principles. There's always some kind of guiding principles that are underlying everything, but getting down to it and teasing it apart, you know what I mean? I mean, like, for me, let me just go on record and go, gravity? Frickin' magic. Right? Case in point. Magic. Why should that be a thing? Why should that be a thing? I mean, I get it. We'd all float off into space if it weren't. But you know what I'm trying to say? And I understand there's, a, I mean, there's still research trying to understand, like, just exactly how does that do what, it, you know what I mean? Pluto flies off a billion, gazillion miles away and just m makes a left and decides to come swinging on back. Bizarre. Magic. But there's science there. There's something going on that, you know, is just incredibly difficult to, to totally comprehend, or even partially comprehend, frankly. You know what I'm trying to say. But, but I think that there's a lot of things technologically that it's all, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you ever had, there's always, it's, it's less of a thing, but for a very long time, and even still now, you go into like, whatever, you're at some office, you're trying to pay your bill for... Um, so Andrew just said, I would, I would say, you know, any sufficiently hidden logic is magic, 
Well, yeah, but some of it's right out there, but you still have to understand it. You know what I mean? Um, but like Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, right? You can't see it. It's a lot of faith. There's a lot of faith in like, and then this thing goes wiggle, wiggle, wiggle with radio. And this receiver on the other end goes, oh, I can feel that coming. You know what I mean? And then I can just use that as a carrier wave and I can suddenly encode a bunch of data on it. Right? It's really, truly really crazy. But at the end of the day, it's about what's hidden and what's not, right? What we're trying to do with 2810 is, is tease that apart for you, you know? Try to, um, I'm going to do this actually before we get to that other one. Uh, we're trying to tease it back apart and, and break it down for you. Now, some of you are, I know, already asking like, okay, this is a class I don't care about. This is stuff I don't care about. I totally get that. I'm never going to use this for the rest of my career. Okay, eh, bull crap alert. No, that is not true. Now, are you going to use everything in this class for the rest of your career directly? No, you're not. Are you going to use calculus for the rest of your career and life? Directly, probably not. I have done precious little of what I would consider to be calculus as calculus professionally. Will the principles that you're understanding influence the way you think about all kinds of things? Absolutely. Same with calculus, same with algebra, right? I mean, algebra, for example, is all about the ability to reason about the world in abstractions without having to be literal, right? So I'm like, you know, uh, three plus four is uh, seven. Okay, what about what about five plus four? Oh, that's a different answer. But if you understand this, the principles, right, then you have this ability to reason where all you've got is X and Y. Y equals MX plus B. I understand that that can represent a line given Cartesian coordinates or whatever, right? I've got the ability to understand this representationally. So I can also understand things like the limit of a function, right? which comes out of calculus. Some of you haven't had all that stuff yet, right? But the limit of a function basically says, as, as, as X gets really, really big, what happens, right? And you're like, well, the whole answer kind of starts to look like infinity or it starts to look like zero or, you know what I mean? As, as X gets big, well, the limit of the function shows up all the time in our actual lives. Here's one, here's one. If everybody in the world acted like you, what would the world be like? That is the limit of the function, which you learn from calculus. Okay? That's a guiding principle for my life. Huh? Right? If I run in and just because I woke up on the wrong side of the day and I'm pissed and I punch you in the face and it's like, well, I'm just pissed that day. Okay? Well, the limit of the function would say as X approaches everybody and everybody who is sort of just pissy can just punch you in the face. You know what I mean? You can kind of look at that and just go, yeah, spoiler for the non-calc students. Sorry, ruined the ending for you. Um, actually, this is just a trailer anyway. This is why you're going to get excited about it. But anyway, does that make sense? Um, there are principles like that, the, like the limit of the function in calculus that, that can guide your thinking and your reasoning about a lot of things in the world. And I think there's a lot of crap in the world right now that, that flows from a failure to understand the limit of the function. You think that you're, you know what I mean? You think you're in this little world where my actions are just me and a failure. I think calculus teaches that. Computer organization, assembly language, down at the low levels, that's really what this is about, you know, from a computational perspective. Because we're all still stuck in the von Neumann architecture for the foreseeable future, quantum computers, blah, blah, blah. But I'm just saying, you know, in practice, going to be a lot of von Neumann for a long time. Um, right. And so, and some of the stuff that you've, that you've learned already a little bit like hex is going to come back. Only it's going to come back with a vengeance here because we're really going to dig back deep into the number systems and understand, you know, kind of how the hell that stuff works. And we're going to break it down and we're going to go all the way down to where the magic happens. Okay. Quantum computing does equal magic. So what I think I want to do, we're really, we're really getting close on time. And some of you have class though, right? Does some of you have class at 
has to be. Some of you have to have class at 2.30. I have this class at 2.30. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Professor. I'm going to have to leave to go to your class. Did you call me Professor? Yes. Okay, student. You're welcome to rejoin me at 2.30 in the other class or not. Thanks, um, no, <laughs> you're going to, I can see already that um, I'm going to have to do something about you. But um, I, I don't, I don't know what it is. It might involve pizza. I can't say, okay? Um, yes. But no, but anyway, uh, that's what I want to do. And so where we're going to go next is right here, the Oso smart computer. Oh, I wanted to say, the, the people in like, it always seemed like it was like you go to the doctor's office or something and back before systems got better. And there was always this lady, I don't know why, but there was this lady always at a, with a big fat CRT terminal monitor, not the CRT, the, yeah, it's cathode ray, the big TV set monitors back in those days. And they would be dealing with suckwad software, crap software. And then, but this is an older person who didn't, I'm not picking on the ladies. I'm just saying a lot of times it was a lady at the doctor's office running the computer. And also because the accent I use when I describe this is always a lady, whatever, because I'm sexist, I guess. But she would always say, I'm just not good at the computer. And I was always felt so sad because, and I would always say, it's not you, it's the computer. Oh no, I'm just not good at the computer. I'm like, you're not supposed to have to be good. Can you drive your car? Or do you say, I'm just not good at the auto mechanics and the mechanical engineering and the automotive engineering. Dumb, dumb. You should be able to drive a car without being an automotive engineer. You shouldn't have to be good at the computer any more than you should be good at the toaster or the freaking ice maker in your freezer if you have one. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say? Now, there is a little bit. I want to just say one thing. I'm going to leave you with this one story about ice makers because I have a minute. This is true. When I had my research lab uh, up at the Y, um, we had a, it was a big room and all my students, we'd live in there and kind of hang out in there. And the next, the next lab over got a big fridge and they were so excited. They had some gift money and so they could buy a big fridge. This relates, believe it or not. They bought this big fridge and, and we were like... Um, Anyway, we had this, we had, there was a window between our two labs. We used to torture them by like just making signs and posters and weird things, just putting them like up backwards, you know, what I mean? stuff like, you know, I mean, stuff like this, only large and just like looking at them, you know, just to, just to a little playful, whatever. So one day, one of the guys goes, um, he's like, hey, check it out. We got a fridge, big fridge. We're like, yeah, very nice. And he goes, these are all master students, mostly in computer science, some PhD, right? And then he goes, it's got an ice maker, right? And one of my students goes, what's your water source? And he goes, <laughs> see, he's just not real good at the ice maker. You know, didn't, hadn't thought through how you get ice, how you get water into that room, you know, in the middle of the, of the CS building, you know what I mean? Anyway, you shouldn't have to be good at the computer, that's the bottom line. But what we're gonna do is, is drill down all the way. And so here's what we're gonna do. We start with the computer's this powerful idiot that does exactly what you're told, what it's told. You like, and at the very lowest level, take this thing, take it here, put it there, go there. That's how the whole thing works. Then you rev it up crazy sick fast billions of times per second and then boom spotify that's the miracle so anyway that's probably good for now we're uh we're on the the back end of time i'm gonna stay here i'm gonna take a little break for like five minutes um but i'll just stay on the chat and i'll stay hey you bet and i'll stay in the testing lobby just on the general so i'll stay on the chat the text chat but I'll also stay in the um, audio channel as well. If anybody has anything they want to just, you know, questions about anything. <laughs> We're going to help uh, Tea Timer, whatever his actual name is, his or her name is, uh, to tie your shoes. We're going to help you out, man. So anyway, and what we're going to do is we're going to, when we come back on Tuesday, we're going to drill down 
uh, from kind of the low level go up and then take it on back down. To just kind of show you from an abstraction perspective how it all fits together, like Chris's oh so beautiful lecture on abstraction from earlier. So um, that's it. That's where we are. That's all I got for now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut down the YouTube uh, recording, but I'll hang out for the next little bit. second.